So again, this is Steve Schnarr. I'm the director of Missouri River Relief, and we host the Big Muddy Speaker Series on the second Tuesday of every month, except for the months when we do it some other Tuesday, um, like this month. In fact, uh, this month we shifted things around so we could be part of a week-long series of events related to World Fish Migration Day, um, which you guys are going to hear about a little bit later once Craig kind of uh, Craig Parker gets gets into the scene. Um, I've got a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, first of all, um, I, I do want to give a shout out to Emily Tracy Smith. She's part of the team that helps us reach out to possible presenters for the Big Muddy Speaker Series. Um, and she helped us arrange tonight's talk with Craig. So Emily, thank you so much for helping out with this. Um, and by the way, those of you in the audience, if you have ideas of topics or actual people that you think would be great um, to share as a Big Muddy Speaker Series presentation, I would love to hear about them. You can email me at steve at riverrelief.org um, anytime. Um, another thank you to River Miles. These are the folks, the Manskers, that put on the MR340 race. And they are also sponsoring the live streaming of the Big Money Speaker Series, which we've been doing since April. And each time uh, we figure a few things out. And I think that finally, everything has worked so far um, this time. So finally figured it out. Um, a couple of, th oh, one other thank you to uh, my wife, Melanie, who she is upstairs just kind of like monitoring things and catching your chat questions and forwarding those to us um, as, as the evening goes on and just making sure that nothing goofy is going on um, in the background. So thank you for that, Melanie. Um, a couple things I just want to let you guys know about what Missouri River Relief has been up to and is up to right now. Um, a couple weekends ago, we hosted the 11th annual Race to the Dome, which is a canoe kayak race um, of a couple different lengths that ends at Wilson Serenity Point in Jefferson City. And it was absolutely fantastic, beautiful fall day. Um, we had uh, 97 paddlers come out which was um, three shy of our legal limit according to COVID regulations in Boone County. So um, we could have had quite a few more and we will sometime in the future. In fact, um, you know, before this talk started, I was showing some slides from last year, all the different stuff that River Relief did last year. And I gotta say it, man, it really kind of gets me to see all those pictures of huge crowds of kids smiling next to the river um, and people hugging each other and um, and all, all just all that kind of stuff that we're missing this year and we know we're gonna get back to, um, we just gotta, you know, work through what we're working through. Um, and it's been wonderful working it through through all of this with, with all of you. Um, so do keep in touch. Um, it means a lot. And one other thing I, I noticed watching the slideshow was how much it rained last year. Oh my God, every other picture, everyone's in rain <laughs> soaking wet. Um, so it's raining tonight too. So there you go. Um, this week we are tomorrow. In fact, we're going to start setting up for a river cleanup at Cooper's Landing. So we're splitting our cleanup into three days and we have you know, much smaller groups than normal, um, but this is gonna be a fantastic week. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, and even if you didn't get a chance to get a volunteer slot for the cleanup, which is limited, um, if you get a chance, stop by. We're, you know, a lot of us will be camping down there. We'll be around all week. Um, and Cooper's Landing is just a fantastic place to visit anyway. So come on by and say, hey. Um, another thing going on this week is um, Kristen and Anna just shipped out all of our boxes for watershed expeditions from home. So this is um, an activity that kids, um, uh, I believe from fourth to fourth grade to um, 12th grade, actually, there's, there's a couple different segments of it, can participate in this with their parents on their own. Um, it's all kinds of outdoor activities to tap into. It's pretty exciting. So the boxes went out and I think that the first 
um, expeditions begin next week. So that, that's exciting to see um, new ways that uh, our students and our community are tapping in, you know, reaching out together and learning more about the really amazing place that we live. Um, but the reason you are here is to hear a presentation from Craig Pockert. And Craig <clears throat> is um, a professor and also a, a biologist um, and also a river ecologist. Um, and he has really worked on river projects all around the world. Uh, we're lucky to have him here in Columbia at the University of Missouri in the School of Natural Resources, where he heads off um, the Fish and Wildlife uh, Co-op Unit at the university. Um, and his presentation today is about really just kind of digging deep into the issues of fish migration. There are a lot of fish species that use all of our freshwater rivers that require like long distance rivers to travel up and down as part of their life cycle, sometimes part of their spawning cycle um, or part of their search for food. So, um, you know, all the changes that we've done to rivers have certainly impacted the ability of some species to migrate. And, and so world fish migration is later this week. Uh, I'm sorry, world fish migration day is later this week. So this talk is kind of, um, honing in on, on that day. So Craig's going to share a little bit about what that, that um, kind of celebration is all about and what the university here is doing to tap into it and to spread the word. And also just some of the issues that he's seen in our rivers um, <clears throat> in all of his studies, including the Missouri River. Um, so Craig, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I'm not completely sure if you're personal video is sharing, but um, we're just going to have to piece this together and see how it goes. Your screen is, your PowerPoint is definitely sharing. Okay. Yep, everything looks good on my end. Um, thanks everyone for uh, taking the time to talk about uh, fish migration uh, today, and hopefully I'll give you a little bit of um, uh, overview of just migration, not only of fish within Missouri, but also around the globe, and some of the things we of humans have done to uh, affect migration, and then hopefully end on a little bit of a, a, a positive note on what some good things we're doing uh, related to fish migration and barrier removal. So um, as Steve said, I'm actually part of the University of Missouri, and I'm part of the, uh, of the leader of the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, which is a joint program uh, between the U.S. Geological Survey, the University of Missouri, uh, Missouri Department of Conservation, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, and a group called the Wildlife Management Institute. So I'm basically here to help uh, MDC, Fish and Wildlife Service, and others uh, with their research needs, and often that's through graduate students. So that's kind of my general job here, and, and my background is uh, strongly linked into uh, large rivers. So as Steve mentioned, the, the reason why the timing of this talk uh, is today is that this Saturday is World Fish Migration Day. And this is a global event uh, that's going to be held uh, on the 24th of October. It was actually delayed from May of 2020 uh, due to COVID, uh, but they're pushing through with uh, this fall. And it's really a celebration of uh, free flowing rivers and bringing awareness to uh, free flowing rivers around the globe. This is, I believe, the fourth year. It happens every other year, might be the fifth uh, that they, they've been doing this. And so um, the activities are varied, like, like what we're doing here, um, the, uh, a seminar. There's also school, you know, like kids events to uh, demonstrations and kayak trips and all sorts of various events. And if you go to the World Fish Migration uh, Day website, you'll see all the events. And every icon here is an event registered for World Fish Migration Day uh, this week. So um, a lot of events as of yesterday, the day before is 308 uh, locations where we're doing this. Pretty heavily in Europe, it actually uh, is organized out of the Netherlands and then pretty heavy on the Eastern side of the US, but you can certainly see that uh, it is around the country. And so you can click on these icons when you get into the, their website and then uh, look at what activities are going on. And if you drill down a little bit into the US, um, you see that 
quite a few activities along the eastern seaboard and then the Pacific Northwest with some dabbling in, in the Great Lakes and, and the, the Midwest. And this was probably not surprising because we do have a lot of fish passage and dam related issues on, you know, on both coasts uh, related to migratory fishes like salmon. Uh, but we're not immune to those here, right, in, in the Midwest. And so uh, as Emily, Tracy Smith, and I started talking about this, oh, maybe a year ago, about the Migration Day, we thought, you know, what better place in, in the U.S., in the central U.S., uh, than Missouri to, to talk about this, given we have two of the largest rivers you know, converging right here in St. Louis with the Mississippi and uh, Missouri River. So it just seemed right that we're a good fit, uh, Missouri's a good fit to uh, uh, have this, this talk about fish migrations. So if you go to the, um, the speaker series website uh, and for this talk, You'll see that there's various links uh, out there. One is to River Studies, which is my website, just talked about the re research we do. But we also have the World Fish Migration Day website, a brochure uh, on uh, World Fish Migration Day and a few other things. But one I wanna highlight in particular is this Love Flows. And this is what it is. It's actually a 34 minute documentary uh, celebrating just free flowing rivers. And so it's a really nice documentary that's been at various film festivals. And I encourage you to uh, take a look at it. It's just on YouTube. And it really is a, a, just a nice overview of the importance of free flowing rivers worldwide. So when we think of migration, you know, if I asked everyone in the, the audience, so what um, migration um, is, I suspect most people would think of waterfowl, you know, ducks or geese moving, um, you know, north or south, or maybe large mammals like caribou migrations uh, going across the, you know, the Arctic plains. And you know, that's, those are certainly migrations. And when we think about what a migration is, you know, it's, it's somewhat of a loose definition, but some sort of annual or daily movements uh, to complete their life cycle. I'm going to talk a lot about reproduction and spawning because that's the classic migration uh, for fish, but it could be overwintering migrations, you know, going down to wintering grounds or even lateral migrations from the main channel to the floodplain. So it doesn't need to be way up river or salmon jumping, you know, over uh, rapids. It could be just a, a main channel fish going into the uh, floodplain to, uh, to eat and get fat. So, uh, as I mentioned that these are kind of two examples of the classic migrations. If you dig a little deeper, there's a lot of really cool bird migrations, neotropical migrants, um, you know, migrate all over the place, monarch butterflies, the Arctic Tern migrates from Greenland down to Antarctica. Uh, so, I mean, some really impressive movements of these, these uh, animals. And if I was going to ask you about a fish migration, I suspect you would think of salmon. That's you know salmon in Alaska. That's kind of the classic uh, migration. Is you see a big old uh, school of salmon going up river, and then what usually goes wrong with that is the classic picture of a a bear um, eating salmon as they're trying to jump up the rapids, going to their spawning grounds. So this also shows you that these migrations are really an ecosystem process. It's not just about the fish going up to spawn. But in this case with the salmon, it's the fish going up to spawn. And then some of those fish get eaten by the bears and the bears actually then go back into the woods in Alaska, poop out the nutrients from the salmon and the trees grow from that. So there's actually signatures of salmon in trees um, you know, up in Alaska through this, this whole migration um, scenario. So it really is an ecosystem approach. And certainly it uh, has very much a cultural significance as well when we talk about uh, migrating fish and, and settlers and, and Native Americans actually uh, following kind of fish migrations uh, uh, throughout their cycle. So when we think of fish migrations, they're really all over the globe. Uh, this is from World Fish Migration Day, just a nice schematic that highlights just a few of the fish that migrate. In North America here, you see the paddlefish. I'll talk a bit about the, uh, the North American paddlefish. It's a classic you know, migrating species in the, in the US. There's certainly sturgeon you know, that, that migrate both 
you know, pallid sturgeon and, and fish that we have in the central U.S. as well as other parts of the world. Uh, we have Mekong giant catfish that I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, there's, you know, large trout up in like Siberia. And I mean, really, there's just about anywhere you go, there's migrating fish. And when we think about historically migrations, or if you're a fish, and set, let's just say you're a paddlefish, because paddlefish are native to the Mississippi River Basin, which is this whole center kind of purplish pink color. So pre-settlement, you could be a paddlefish up in western Montana and swim down to New Orleans and swim all the way up to southwest New York. I mean, there was enough connectivity uh, historically to do that. So that's what you've evolved. If you're a paddlefish or a sturgeon, that's what you've evolved, you know, around is these um, these connected, free-flowing rivers. Um, not so much the case anymore. Um, if humans are good at one thing, it's screwing up the environment. Um, and no great surprise, I'm going to talk quite a bit about about dams, and I'm going to talk about dams as they relate to fish right here in Missouri, uh, on the Missouri River and the Osage River, but then also on the Yangtze River and some other rivers uh, in, in China and uh, other places in the world, because really the, the issues are very similar, you know, just, just different uh, geography and maybe different fish species, but the bottom line is migratory fish need connected rivers uh, to fulfill their life cycle, and when we put a big concrete structure in the middle of it, that's pretty hard to, to navigate around. So why do we care? You know, what's the big deal uh, if we have, um, you know, dams throughout the, um, you know, North America, or if you think of the Missouri River, the lowest dam on the Missouri River is Gavin's Point, South Dakota. So we have, you know, below that free flowing river from through Nebraska, through Missouri, and then, you know, you could argue down all the way to New Orleans. That seems like a lot of river. Uh, so what's, what's the problem that we've dammed a few of them? Well, uh, there's been some research uh, recently on uh, what they're calling the mega fishes or the mega fauna, and that uh, these these fishes, this this group of fishes, has declined uh, by about 88 percent since 1970. So that's just 50 years, and then we've seen you know almost 90 percent declines. And this graph just shows this generalized decline that. This is actually in 1970, the population size on average of these mega fishes. So you can see that it just gets lower and lower down to you know 10% or under uh, in some cases for these fish. And this fish is a broader group. Um, two examples that I have here, one, you know, there's a lot of sturgeon species throughout the world. This is a beluga sturgeon in the US and actually right here in Missouri, we have alligator gar. They're found in the boot heel, but they're considered one of these mega fishes as well. And a big reason why these fishes are, are going away is because of the loss of free-flowing rivers and overfishing. And, and I don't want to give you the impression that this is all about uh, dams. I mean, overfishing, particularly commercial fishing uh, in other countries, has, and, and then in the U.S. historically, has been a, a big issue for these fishes. They're very long-lived fishes. Some live over 100 years. Uh, well, you know, they live over 100 years. They may uh, become sexually mature at 10 years, 20 years old. So it takes a long time to replenish uh, a fish population when it uh, declines quite a bit. So this is kind of a big deal um, that these these mega fishes are are going away. And one other example here is is from the Mekong River, and this is the Mekong giant catfish one of the largest fish and freshwater fish in the world. And just in the last two decades, it's seen about a 90% decline. And right now monitoring efforts in, in Southeast Asia where uh, they, the Mekong is, that they're only catching about 10 fish a year. Um, that's not a lot of fish when you think of a, a multi-country um, uh, river system. So this is, this is a problem. Um, now these have been protected for a while. Um, so there are efforts underway to protect and restore these, these fish. Uh, so it's illegal to harvest them, but it's also considered uh, in some cultures that it's good fortune forever if you actually eat the flesh of a, a, a Mekong giant catfish. So there's, uh, from the cultural standpoint, a little bit of a dilemma there that um, you want to protect these species, but boy, it might be, uh, you know, might be easy to look the other way if, if this is going to provide you a good fortune forever. So uh, one 
issue that really kind of struck home with me with these these mega fishes and the free flowing lack of free flowing rivers is the Chinese paddlefish. And I started my career um, in Oklahoma working on the paddlefish that we have around here, the North American paddlefish. Um, that's I did my master's degree at Oklahoma State working on movements of these fish, fascinated by them. And I remember reading about this other paddlefish uh, on the other side of the world in China, the Chinese paddlefish. And I thought, man, my, you know, I would love in my career to see a Chinese paddlefish in the wild. Um, unfortunately, I, I didn't have that chance. I was able to go over to China uh, and it was too late. Uh, it's officially declared extinct uh, as of about a year ago. Uh, and the one that uh, I was close to is, is an actual preserved specimen that's in Wuhan, China at a, at a museum. But these fish are similar to our North American paddlefish, but it is more like a sword. They do have teeth, they eat fish, uh, and they grew up to 23 feet long. So these things were huge. Um, but dams... Uh, you know, in particular, we're blocking their migrations on the Yangtze. And uh, some researchers just last year published a paper saying, and the scientific community has said, yep, they're extinct. We just, we have yet to find one. I think the last one was 2003, if I remember correctly. So that one kind of struck home since I really loved uh, working on the North American paddlefish and just letting it sink in that I will never have the opportunity to see one of these fish. So if we circle back to Missouri, um, you know, we've already talked about the North American paddlefish. That's one of our big migrators. In fact, these, the top four species here, the three sturgeons and the paddlefish, I would say are kind of the, the classic migrators. I, the, the numbers I have here say that they migrate at least 180 miles. There's actually a lot of them that move a lot more than that, but that's just some stats that I've heard. Um, but all these fish migrate. They all really prefer free flowing rivers. And we also have some fish like the blue sucker uh, that's in this category as well, that that, that will move a couple hundred uh, kilometers, you know, 150 plus miles or so uh, on its uh, migration routes. So all these fish love to have free flowing rivers so they can swim up river and, and spawn and, and carry on um, their, their um, life cycle and their, um, their populations. So, Generally, these fish are fairly big. You know, paddlefish uh, get to you know over 100 pounds. Uh, lake sturgeon get to 100 pounds. The pallid and shovelnose are a little smaller as well as the sucker, but still pretty good sized fish. But not all big fish are um, migratory fish, and just because you're small doesn't mean you don't migrate. And here's a good example. This is the Alabama shad. Uh, I didn't really know about this fish until I came to Missouri about 10 years ago. I think in Alabama shad, you know, we, we catch these things here in Missouri. They're actually from the Gulf of Mexico, and they come up to the Osage, lower Osage and Gasconade rivers, as well as some others, to spawn. And we actually have caught uh, juvenile uh, Alabama shad in these rivers in the fall. So uh, it's been discussed that maybe the Osage and Gasconade River are some of the last... Uh, populations um, in the Mississippi River where these, these fish spawn. This fish only grows at most maybe 18 inches, 12 to 18 inches. So it swims all the way up, up to Missouri from the Gulf uh, to, um, to survive and carry on its progeny. But there's one fish that kind of takes the cake around here, and that's the American eel. So this is another just amazing critter. Uh, this is uh, an American eel. Um, that was caught in the lower Osage River. That's uh, Josie Ridgeway, uh, who was a technician here uh, with us, but um, uh, now he's actually working in Columbia um, uh, with um, the USGS. But this fit, this uh, eel actually spawns in the Sargasso Sea, kind of out by um, Bermuda, like just north of Bermuda, and then swims into the United States or into the um, rivers like the Osage or up the Mississippi and the Missouri and into the Osage. And the females will remain there for most of their lives. So this is pretty incredible that this this eel came from somewhere you know out north of Bermuda. Um, so it's pretty fascinating some of the life cycles of these fish. So I'm going to get a little bit more in detail on some lake sturgeon uh, in Missouri. And you may have um, remembered seeing Michael Moore, who's a PhD student of mine, uh, talk about lake sturgeon uh, movements uh, in the Osage and Gasconade rivers, because he actually gave a, a Big Muddy Speaker series talk 
a year, maybe a year and a half ago. I'm just going to touch on a little bit of this, but this is a project where we uh, worked with MDC to try to learn uh, where these fish move, uh, particularly in the tributaries of the Missouri River. Do they stay in the Osage? Do they stay in the Gasconade? If not, where do they go? And so I'm just going to talk about a few examples of where these fish go. So hopefully you can see this. So this is a map of um, the uh, Lake Sturgeon Perry. And I, I should say that uh, the names of these fish are from um, uh, a elementary school class, or I think it, it might be middle school, that Michael has um, engaged in this and they are they're naming all the all the sturgeon that he implanted with transmitters so it's kind of a, a fun outreach event but we have jefferson city here here's the osage river uh lake of the ozarks the gasconade river and then the missouri river so this was tagged in the lower osage or lower gasconade river uh in 2018 and two years later in spring of 20 it moved way up here over 150 miles upstream on the gasconade down by uh, fort leonard wood and for those of you that know the Gasconade, this is not considered like big river fish territory. This is smallmouth bass territory. So this fish moved quite a ways up, but remained in you know, the same river, the Gasconade River. We actually have a fair amount of fish that, that don't remain in these rivers. This is Sheldon, and he's a 50 inch male. And he was actually tagged down. So, so this is uh, a larger scale. This is Kansas City to St. Louis with the Missouri River, Jeff City right here, Omaha. Uh, is, is Nebraska is right here. So it was tagged down by the Osage River and actually then lost, or we, we didn't know where it went for three years. And it was found um, by the Fish and Wildlife Service up in Yankton, South Dakota, below Gavin's Point Dam. And it actually stayed up there the, the rest of this, the, this past summer. Um, so it moved all the way up about 650 miles from where we tagged it to, um, uh, to South Dakota. So that's, that's a long migration uh, for one of these fish. Uh, we have Liam and Marge, and this, uh, if I remember right, was Liam, uh, and these were some fairly large fish, a 63-inch male and a 52-inch female, and again, Jefferson City here, and they were tagged down by uh, Lake, um, or the Osage River mouth with the Missouri River, and then they swam downstream towards St. Louis, and then went up the Mississippi River to a lock and dam structure at Keokuk, Iowa, and that's where they were found. Um, and so these fish again moved up and you know up this river until it reached a barrier at uh, the Lock and Dam. So another large large migration for these fish. And I'll end with Bob. Uh, so Bob was a 48 inch uh, male, and he was actually tagged down in the um, Osage River. Uh, so again the the St. Louis here, and this is the Missouri River with Jeff City right here. He was tagged in the Osage River, decided to go down the Missouri River, and then move up the Gasconade for a little while, and hung out there for a while, and then apparently got bored with that, and then ended up going downstream to the Gasconade, then up the Missouri, and then up the Sheraton River, all the way into Iowa, and was detected by um, colleagues at Iowa State uh, that had a remote receiver up there below Rathbun Lake Dam. So the Sheraton River, particularly as you get up here, is again, not big river fish territory. So these fish are using some of these smaller rivers that we didn't think they actually would use. And another thing to note is it ended, the, the last location, upstream location, was at a barrier at, at uh, this dam. So what triggers these movements? Why is a fish moving you know, up to Iowa or South Dakota? Um, in general, for spawning movements, we think of three um, primary mechanisms for fish to uh, move. One is, is flows or river flows. Another is the water temperature. And then the third is the photo period. And think of the photo period as like the daylight cycle. What day of the year is it? Um, so <clears throat> typically we look for all of these conditions, the right flows, right temperature, right photo period to kind of merge together to uh, dictate when a fish will move. Um, but it's, it's hard to really decipher the kind of intricacies of movement with the, all these three components. And sometimes we think that flow is really more considered the master variable. So that may, if, if I was gonna force one, one of those three uh, mechanisms to really manage for fish, it would probably be flows. Um, and this is just some example from paddlefish in Oklahoma that, um, <clears throat> 
in one year, uh, we had the, how this is set up is that we have um, paddlefish tagged in, in this river, in the Arkansas River, and it has a choice to swim up the Arkansas River or a choice to, to swim up the Salt Fork River. So basically, it's at a fork in the road. You know, what, which, which what are you going to choose? And if this is the hydrograph, this is the discharge in both rivers. So this is the Arkansas River, the dark line, and the dashed line is the Salt Fork River. So paddlefish were found in both rivers when both rivers peaked in that discharge uh, at roughly the same, same time. The next year, we had pretty low flows for a while, but then only the Salt Fork River uh, had a surge in discharge well before a couple of weeks before the, the Arkansas River. All the paddlefish went up uh, the Salt Fork River to uh, spawn. So this kind of gives you an idea of they, you know, they have a choice of where to go and they typically follow the flow. So flow is pretty darn important uh, when we talk about uh, fish migrations. So then, you know, what happens when we disrupt um, you know, these, these factors? Well, we do, as I mentioned earlier, we're pretty good at, at disrupting a lot of these factors, uh, not only from a connectivity standpoint, but then just altering flows and temperatures uh, as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and what happens when these things get disrupted. But I wanna first um, just quickly revisit those examples of lake sturgeon that I talked about. So I, I showed you examples of five lake sturgeon four of them, the upstream migration ended at a dam, either a lock and dam structure, Rathbun Lake Dam in Iowa or Gavin's Point Dam in South Dakota. Only one uh, was not um, stopped by uh, 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 some sort of barrier, and that was uh, this Perry in the Gasconade. I, I'll bet my bottom dollar that these other four fish, if those dams, if Gavin's Point wasn't there, the lock and dam uh, on the Mississippi River wasn't there, Rathbun Lake wasn't there, they would have kept going. So they are going to these places. This It's not a choice for them to stop. They don't have a choice uh, to, to stop at these barriers. So really, when we look at um, the probably the biggest one factor that has uh, affected fish uh, migrations, uh, it is dams and the associated effects with the dams. And whether it's Gavin's Point Dam in South Dakota that's been um, implicated in declines of pallid sturgeon, uh, this Gezhuba Dam uh, in China, which was one of the first dams before the Three Gorges Dam, which is the really large one on the Yangtze. This one was the first one in the series that was implicated in the extinction of the Chinese paddlefish. Bagnell Dam uh, has been implicated in declines of, of, of the North American paddlefish. And even, and I'll talk about this a little bit in more detail, even the, um, the lock and dam structure, number one, on the Osage River. So this is that dilap dilapidated structure about 12 miles up from the Missouri River mouth. Um, this has an effect on fish passage as well. Even though at times fish can pass it, it still is a disruption. And I'll, I'll talk about, a little bit about that. We're not alone here in Missouri when we talk about uh, uh, the lack of free flowing rivers. And some recent work that's gotten a lot of attention has found that 37% of the largest rivers in the world are free flowing. So almost two thirds are not. And so any river in red here is effectively a heavily impacted river, it's not free flowing. When you look at the United States, you don't see much blue, which is the free flowing rivers or even green that are partially impacted. You see a lot of red um, and you see a lot of red in Europe. Where you don't see the red, you see the, the blues are more the less developed, less populated areas you know, the, the Yukon and, and Northern Canada to uh, Northern China, Siberia, and then some places in Africa and, and South America. So, um, you know, when we're talking about developed areas like um, uh, Europe and, and North America and, and the United States, we're pretty good at, at uh, stopping or altering flows in these rivers. And what does that mean? Um, you know, I've already talked a little bit about the Mekong giant catfish and with, in some of these areas that like the Mekong River, um, there is, is ongoing dam development. So uh, there's 11 uh, planned dams uh, on the Mekong River right now, as well as several that are operational, uh, operationable now. Um, so this is a pretty active area for dam development. Uh, another active area uh, is um, 
the Jinsha River Basin, which is in, it's a tributary of the Yangtze, and I worked with some colleagues in China to analyze some data with um, this area. And in this Jinsha River, there's nine planned hydroelectric dams uh, that are, are scheduled to be built. And 12 have been built since 2010. So in the last 10 years, 12 have been built and another nine are, are proposed uh, to be uh, built. That's a lot of dams. And in an era that you contrast with us, with uh, the US, we had our dam building phase, but it was 50 years ago or so. Other parts of the world are in their dam building phase now. So um, when we talk about the Missouri River, you know, and you guys, if, if you haven't seen this map, you've seen something very similar time and time and time again uh, through this, uh, this ser the speaker series. But we do have uh, these various Missouri River reservoirs uh, through the Dakotas and into Montana um, that have dams on them. And those were uh, through the Pick Sloan uh, program that uh, where these were built. Um, but what you don't see here is that we still have quite a few um, uh, larger dams in the watershed. And uh, there's been some research to show that at least the definition of a large dam here is it holds at least 250,000 acre feet, which is uh, of water, which is a weird number to, to think of. And I was trying to find a, an example reservoir that was about that size. And I actually didn't find a really good example, but this is about one eighth of, of Lake of the Ozarks. So, you know, Lake of the Ozarks goes, oh, 70 miles, you know, up, each river arm roughly. So one eighth of that would be the dams. There's 21 dams, at least one eighth of Bagnell and bigger. So this doesn't include the small um, impoundments, you know, on farm ponds and, and water, you know, like municipal water supplies, those type of things. Uh, those have impacts at a smaller scale, but uh, these dams, there's still a lot of these larger dams um, on tributaries of, of the Missouri River. So, the obvious thing the dams do is block passage. You know, you, a fish runs into a concrete wall. Well, they do a lot of other things too. And I'm going to show you some examples here. Uh, on the right is an example of a hydrograph. So this is just how much discharge by season or month. So this is January. You know, on the right side of these graphs is December. Uh, this is the Colorado River through Grand Canyon and the Missouri River through Nebraska. And what you see historically, so this is kind of the historic hydrograph, very typical of what you you would see um, in a lot of rivers um, that are unaltered, that you have some sort of spring, you know, rise or increase in flows, uh, usually related to snow melt or spring rains, and then you reach some sort of, um, you know, low steady flow and kind of late summer and into fall. The Missouri River has a similar pattern. It's slightly different that it has kind of two peaks, likely related to snowmelt and rainfall. Uh, but what I want you to compare it to is this is effectively the current hydrograph now. So when you look at the Colorado River, if you are a fish that's evolved to trigger your movements on flow based on a rising hydrograph, you got nothing now. You know, you don't have a trigger. The Missouri River, you know, looks a little better. It still ain't great, but um, you lost those peaks uh, and you've continued this relatively high water, you know, into the, the fall. So these peaks are often what fish are, are triggering to. That makes them move up river to spawn. So whether you're in the Colorado River or the Missouri River, a lot of that is gone and that's through dam regulation. Another thing that happens is a little bit more on the finer scale. And this is actually the Osage River hydrograph. Um, and the, the, Os the Bagnell Dam is a hydropeaking dam. So what it does is it, it actually um, releases water based on energy needs. So this is roughly a year, a little bit more, April of 2016 to June of 17 of um, the hydrograph. And what you'll notice is this just goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, even if you break that down into one month, you see that you know you have almost daily peaks and then dropping down and, and you know you have that you know that ricochet kind of bouncing back and forth with occasional kind of low steady flows in between. So again, think of it if you're a paddlefish or a sturgeon and you're triggered on on um, rising flows, well, you might start to swim up here and then go, oh crap, a day later I'm swimming down because the flow you know, dropped and then a day or two later it might go up again. 
you're you're going to be a very confused fish uh, if you want to spawn, uh, you know, in the Osage River. And so these disruptions of these predictable patterns um, is really one of the issues when we talk about flow regulation and dams. Another thing that happens is actually um, temperature changes. And uh, just um, more highlighting um, the Colorado River here, but there is changes even in, in the more kind of warm water rivers like we have in the Missouri. But another example is the Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze River actually caused about a five degree Celsius change in water temperature. That may not seem like a lot, but fish are usually cued in on just a few degrees, maybe two, three, four degrees uh, of, of temperature. So this, this is a big deal. And, and this is actually what this change has done has shifted the temperature, the day that the temperatures are suitable for Chinese sturgeon spawning by almost a month. So think of it this way, now that the uh, temperature has changed, um, that the suitable temperature uh, maybe historically was April 1st, now it's May 1st. So that photo period disruption may happen. And this is the Chinese sturgeon is a critically endangered fish. Uh, as you can see, another really large long lived fish. Uh, and you know, this is really screwing their um, reproductive cycle as well. If we look at temperature in Grand Canyon, so this is Glen Canyon Dam. And so you're looking at this from the Lee's Ferry area upstream to the dam. Behind this picture, kind of uh, towards your back would be uh, Grand Canyon. And when you look at the temperature of the Colorado River pre-dam, you can see that it went 25, 27 degrees C all the way down to freezing. And it fluctuated regularly as soon as the dam went in it pretty much stabilized at 10 degrees Celsius. This is another way to look at it. It's a little bit more of a schematic, but we, we did some modeling on the effects of um, the uh, temperatures on uh, native fish in the Colorado River. And historically, this is generally what the temperatures look like in the Colorado River. This is what they look like now. So again, no peak warm temperatures. Um, you know, you're pretty much right around 10, 11 degrees C all the time. What this is, is at the time when we did this research, there was discussion about trying to um, create a temperature control device or basically um, sucking water from different parts of the water column to increase the water, down, water temperature downstream in, in Grand Canyon. Um, and what's interesting about this is that this was the capacity of the dam. So even if we wanted to, there was no physical way that we could get 25 degrees C uh, at a Glen Canyon Dam, just the engineers said, we just can't do it. So, you know, in this situation, if we wanted to increase it, we're not even gonna reach what were historical um, levels of temperature in the past. So another important consideration too, is when we talk about um, flows and predictable patterns like flooding, um, that this actually created connectivity laterally as well. And so kind of the classic example is, you know, in the Missouri River, when you have, um, you know, the main channel uh, area during a, you know, a high water event, during a flood, you end up flooding those kind of back channels and floodplains. If they're allowed to flood and, and don't have the, um, the levees there, this is an incredibly productive place for a fish to be. It has a lot of food. Uh, they can go in there and eat a lot of food, be in warmer temperatures and grow pretty fat before they uh, head down into the main channel to uh, face all the, the evils that are happening in, in the, the um, main channel and predators and all sorts of things. So um, this is another component when you talk about migration is it really can be lateral migration. And we've disconnected the floodplain um, from uh, the main channel. And of course, this isn't just due to, to dams, but to channelizations. I suspect many of you have seen this figure as well, kind of the classic compare and contrast what the Missouri River looked like pre and post um, uh, channelization. So, um, you know, this is another issue when you talk about the effects of dams. So I mentioned earlier about the lock and dam structure uh, on the lower Osage River. And, you know, the the good news is that these are semi-permeable. They, they do pass fish uh, and we've documented it that if sturgeon and paddlefish have gone upstream, but obviously it just depends on you know, what the flow is like. So here's two, 
two pictures of the lock and dam structure, low flow and high flow. So obviously you can see here, fish could swim above that. So it's not a complete um, impassable barrier. And even at low flows, maybe through the lock structure, some fish could get through, but we still see different fish communities above and below this lock and dam structure. So there's, uh, and we see congregations of fish uh, in spring, um, when there isn't high flows uh, below that lock and dam structure. So there is still concerns about even, even a, a structure like this having some effect on um, uh, connectivity of the rivers, even though it's not a 100% barrier. And another interesting point um, that you probably don't think of is that sometimes these um, barriers could be more behavioral. Um, so we deal with this more on smaller streams uh, where there's a lot of emphasis on fish passage, uh, like re redesigning culverts, that type of thing for small bodied fishes. Um, but think of it this way, that even if you have enough water going through a culvert and the depth and the flow, like say in, in this culvert in the upper right, well, if you're a fish, a little you know four inch shiner, like an endangered Topeka shiner, and you start swimming up here, you may want, you may not want to go through this big, black hole um, to reach the other side. That's probably a pretty scary thing that you're not used to. You haven't been um, evolved in that type of condition. So there's actually been research to show that even though they, they're able to pass, some fish may not pass just for behavioral reasons. I, I'm probably making, well, I, I know I'm making this more simple than, than it is. Uh, and it's certainly not as simple as let's blow out dams or modify dams, and we have this all figured out. The fish don't make it easy uh, on us. And it's when they can't talk to us, it's hard to figure out exactly what they want. And this is an example from uh, the USGS Science Center here, CERC. Um, it's actually from uh, Pat Broughton from the uh, Upper Missouri River, but um, out of the CERC lab here, that this is a, a pallid sturgeon up in the Yellowstone River. And you can see this is the river kilometer on the Yellowstone River where it was at. And pre-spawn, it kind of hung around the lower um, 10 kilometers or so of the, the Yellowstone. And then right after the 1st of May, it shot up 45 kilometers um, and went to this, this area and then decided pretty soon after that, I'm just going to go right back down. And then it decided a couple days later to go back up a little bit again and then back down and went like back and forth, back and forth. And eventually... Um, Pat and the, the crews uh, documented spawning right right here, kind of as that declining limb of this last um, uh, this last high flow event. So we don't know why it didn't spawn in all these other kind of options. So sometimes it's really hard to decipher exactly, you know, what these fish want. And we also have to recognize that just like humans, fish are individuals. We try to make generalizations when you know you just have you know, that weird uncle, you know, that fish have the, their weird uncle as well, that maybe doesn't uh, 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 hum the same tune as the rest of the group. So, so it is hard to figure out some of these things. It's not easy. So hopefully this has given you a little bit of a background on um, the importance of connectivity and free flowing rivers. And it brings me back to the, the title. And, and the point of this title was, to think about that to move or not move is not the question for a migratory fish. They have to move. Um, we don't give them a chance to move at times because of the things we as humans do. So it's not about a choice. They need to move and spawn uh, in these upper river reaches uh, to continue their life cycle. So we need to help them find ways to do that. I always try to end some of these talks on a little bit of a positive note. We're real good as kind of fish and wildlife biologists and ecologists. We do a lot of, we study a lot of doom and gloom and declines of species and, and habitats. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're not doing good things. And one thing that the U.S. has actually really, has been in vogue in the last five years or so in the U.S. is dam removals. Um, so just in the three years, 2016 to 18, here's a map of all the dam removals in the U.S. Um, so I mentioned early on um, some of the dam building in the Mekong River um, and in, in the Yangtze River and the Jinsha River Basin. Um, 
we're we're looking at some of these dams to remove. And the classic one is in in uh, Washington, this Elwha Dam, and that's the size of it. And I believe that is still the largest dam that has been ever removed. Um, so these aren't, you know, Hoover Dam, but they're still pretty good sized dams. And a lot of these are dilapidated structures that just aren't being used anymore. But there's political will and interest to to remove these things. So it's something that is on the table now that I would argue maybe 50 years ago really wasn't on the table, um, all to help kind of river restoration and natural function of rivers, which obviously helps uh, the native fish. Um, we're, there are recovery efforts, um, you know, in place, uh, whether, you know, you're working on the Chinese sturgeon, uh, where they're reintroducing Chinese sturgeon to the Yangtze, and this is kind of a, a, a public day uh, uh, where they release some hatchery reared fish back into the Yangtze. Those are baby Chinese sturgeon. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see here, it, it gets a bit of press. It's, it's uh, uh, quite a bit of interest. Even though this is not related to um, dams, one thing that I think is, is pretty um, surprising is that China, starting this year, January 2010, has initiated a 10-year commercial fishing ban on the Yangtze River. And if I remember correctly, it's not the entire Yangtze, but it's a vast majority of it, like 326 regions. Um, and it's so they started in January 2010 by January or 2020, by January 2021, I believe all of this will be fully implemented. This is a big deal uh, to re remove all commercial fishing from these areas all to protect native fish, like the Chinese sturgeon, um, you know, the uh, finless porpoise and, and some other really unique fish uh, in, in that river. So that's pretty cool. And I think you know, that's a big effort to, uh, to think about something like that. And these aren't just happening, you know, halfway around the world. As you guys probably well know, you know, we have recovery programs, you know, whether it's a Mississippi River or the Missouri River Recovery Pro Program that uh, you guys have probably heard a lot of over the last uh, 10 years, or if not more, from, you know, uh, Carrie Elliott and Rob Jacobs, Jacobson, Susanna Irwin, uh, Dwayne Chapman with Asian Carp. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of folks right in Columbia that are working on recovering the Missouri River and developing models and uh, building hypotheses to try to figure out these complicated uh, mechanisms to uh, help recover some of these fish like the pallid sturgeon. And I'm going to end with, I think, just a really cool thing. Um, when in the last 25 years, maybe there's been an emphasis on fish ladders. So if you go out to say the Columbia River, you know Portland, Oregon, or, or that area, and uh, drive up the uh, the river, you can stop at these dams, and there's fish ladders there, and it literally is almost a stair step with water going through it, and the salmon swim up these ladders and move on their way. Well, um, for some of these larger fish like sturgeon and even paddlefish, they're actually now creating fish elevators. So this is on the Menominee River, which is a border river between Michigan and Wisconsin that goes into Lake Michigan. And they're creating this elevator to help pass Lake Sturgeon. So this is actually looking down at the elevator. So you're kind of looking down the elevator shaft. So this is kind of a pulley system with chains. So there's flow going through this, this area to bring the fish in. When they get enough fish, they, they shut the gate. They raise them up to a sorting facility here. And depending on what fish it is, they may do some measurements. In this case, some university students are implanting transmitters into Lake Sturgeon. Then they put them on the back of a flatbed trailer uh, behind a pickup truck and truck them up above the dam. And they, they move these Lake Sturgeon above the dam. So this is a pretty cool thing. And when you think of just the effort uh, involved in something like this and the political will to say, this is worth doing, this is pretty cool. So. We are doing some right, you know, some good things for for native fish and native fish recovery. So that's kind of in a nutshell uh, my um, take on fish migration and why we need free flowing rivers. I'd encourage you to take a look at that World Fish Migration Day and a lot of these events, if they're virtual like this one, they are open to the public. Um, so you can search that World Fish Migration Day and listen to another seminar about what's going on in Europe or Brazil or something like that. So it really is kind of a, a neat place to um, 
to learn about all the different fish species out there and the importance of free flowing rivers. And I will stop right there and uh, have, I guess, Steve uh, monitor any questions that he may have for me. Awesome, Craig, that, that is fascinating. Um, thank you so much. Um, you know, the thing about rivers is they, they connect all of our communities to each other. They connect different parts of the landscape to each other. And <clears throat> in, that, in that kind of way, once we start mucking around with things, or once we start studying, you know, what goes on in these long rivers, um, you know, it's like one story teases out another, you know, and, and it's just cool. You just, I mean, you, I can tell that you're a teacher just the way that you um, share those stories with people. Now, I forgot before this presentation to mention to people that they can leave questions throughout the presentation in the chat um, or, in our Q&A and at this point we don't have any questions, but I'm hoping that people will think about it for a second and start typing questions in there. Um, I have a question though. Yeah. That, um, so you you just um, talked about, oh, people that they can leave. Um, you just talked about the fish elevator for Lake Sturgeon in Wisconsin and you know, basically you talked about them moving. So the lake sturgeon are coming in below the dam and they're moving them to the top of the dam. Like, do they have a reverse elevator? Do the fish ever want to go back to the river? Like uh, what happens? Yeah. So actually they do. And I didn't have a, um, I didn't kind of go into that, but so it's actually a shoot and I'm not exactly sure if, if they go into almost like a holding basin that then they get kind of passed downstream. But on the side of the dam, it looks like, I don't know, a big three foot diameter culvert, you know, <laughs> on an angle. So um, the fish go into some sort of basin and then they just get slid, you know, right on down below the dam. <laughs> cool. So yeah, this is, cause yeah, it is a two way street. Cause a lot of these fish, they go up to spawn but then they're repopulating you know, the lower rivers or, you know, in this case, Lake Michigan. Um, so yeah, and there is, you do need to have that back and forth. Um, so I, I, I have wondered, you know, about Lake Sturgeon. We know that, um, <clears throat> you know, Lake Sturgeon, we find them in the Missouri River and the Osage River. Um, and you just described a life cycle that involves going from rivers to lakes. So the Great Lakes, I think Lake Michigan is, is what you were talking about. Um, what's that cycle like in the big rivers, like the Missouri and the Osage for Lake Sturgeon, where they don't have any lakes except the ones we created, which they can't get to? Right. And, and yeah, so the, the, the name Lake Sturgeon is not a good name for it. Um, and so these lake sturgeon were native to the large rivers like the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. So they actually will go up to kind of rocky shorelines or, or like you know, rip rappy areas to spawn. And one kind of success story, or at least we think is leading to a success story is the lake sturgeon right here in Missouri. That um, some of you may recall that, oh, maybe four or five years ago, an angler was fishing down by St. Louis it actually took video of some fish splashing against the rocks, the riprap, and it was lake sturgeon. And Missouri Department of Conservation uh, came in, scraped some eggs, found some eggs, and hatched them, and they were lake sturgeon. Cool. So there is some evidence that sturgeon are spawning, um, at least on the riprap on the Mississippi River. Uh, Travis Moore, who's the lake sturgeon biologist for the Missouri Department of Conservation, gets calls occasionally of people reporting, you know, just splashing around. Um, along shorelines, along riprap of various rivers in the state. Uh, so um, we think that there is some evidence that they're spawning. One of the reasons why we did this study was to at least define where they go. Like they, we didn't realize they went as far up the Gasconade uh, as they did. They go up to up the Osage all the way to Bagnell Dam and they obviously get stopped. But they do have a life cycle that they can survive in the rivers themselves. And a, another, video or something to keep in mind. I think it's probably shut off now, but up in some of the rivers in Wisconsin, there's, there's actually a group called Sturgeon for Tomorrow. And there's 
the the lake sturgeon get um, spawn right next to shore, and so along like parks. So they actually have videos of the you know, like live videos, live cams where you can see lake sturgeon spawning. And during this time, since they are in public places, and you could literally just reach down and grab a 75 pound lake sturgeon, that they do have patrols there so people don't um, uh, don't disturb them. But yeah, uh, it's usually around. <clears throat> April or so that if you'll search sturgeon for sturgeon for tomorrow or sturgeon cam, you'll see some sturgeon cams up in Wisconsin. Amazing. Well, I almost called out David Owens because he is always good for excellent questions. Um, and sure enough, he popped on and he was wondering, you know, we've been talking about lar longer uh, migrations of fish for, for large species. Are there shorter migrations for smaller species? Like, like there are with some bird species? Yeah, yeah, there are. And um, a lot of those, you know, depending on what you call movement slash migration, but, you know, we have fish like, you know, small darters and, and you know, fish that are several inches long that will go up to, say, riffles to spawn and then kind of drop back down into more deep water areas. But maybe it's just 100 meters or so. You know, some fish just live their life cycle in a very small area. Um, <clears throat> Smallmouth bass, uh, you know, we've used uh, telemetry on them, and they'll they'll go twenty some miles. So they go fairly long distances, but not huge distances. So yeah, kind of migration is a relative term. I mean, the the you know, what we see like these big ones get all the press, uh, but there is still a lot of these smaller migrations. And I also will say that, um, and this is kind of I'm at fault for just doing this with this talk is you highlight these super extensive migrations that then you know every now and again you'll hear of like a great white shark that they found you know halfway across the ocean that's not typically the average fish maybe the average lake sturgeon is only moving 50 or 60 miles but then we see these these longer migrations so so it is a little deceiving that those are the sexy ones that everyone wants to talk about but isn't necessarily the average fish I think it's interesting that you call that that fish sexy when it actually could just be like the weird uncle that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, that likes to go on road trips. Yep. Um, well, uh, <clears throat> that is still the only question we have at this point that I can tell. Um, not seeing any on YouTube. So basically, that means that um, you've answered everyone's questions. They, you've given such a thorough presentation on fish migration that there's, um, you know, everyone's satiated and, and, uh, and I get that. It, uh, it was an awesome talk, Craig, and thank you very much. Um, well, I'll, I'll say effort together to, to share that. I'll say too, to, to, yeah, look at that world fish migration, um, uh, site, maybe look up the website for the fisheries conservation foundation. They're doing some work, uh, on, that's here in, in Bhutan, which is, it looks like a big carp, but is a, a valuable fish um, in, in that part of the world. And they know very, very little about it. So, um, and there's a lot of species like that in different parts of the world that we know very little about their migrations. But um, it's been some, some neat, there's some neat research and, and uh, science going on with Matsir um, out in Bhutan. And I'll remind people too that, um, you know, earlier Craig mentioned uh, a documentary called Love Flows, I believe. Yes. Um, yep. And I have updated our website, bigmoneyspeakers.org. So if you look in the archive section after today's webpage disappears, look in that archive section and you'll be able to link to the YouTube version of Love Flows, um, which is a super cool documentary, a beautiful documentary. Um, with a ton of cool information as well. Um, and David Owens did want to say that it's been a very interesting presentation with a bunch of new information to digest and thank you. Um, and Barb Elmore also says thank you. Um, well, it's fun to do this. This is, this is neat to do and it's, it's always a great you know, speaker series that you guys have had. I, I've been in Missouri about 10 years now and, and so it's always been fun to, to kind of watch well, these um, in person, now over Zoom. Yeah, it's embarrassing. It's taken 10 years for us to actually get you to do a talk, Craig, but... Um, well, perhaps... we've kind of, we've laughed and joked about that because I've had several of my students give talks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lisa Webb, uh, who's uh, uh, 
a colleague of mine gave a talk and I'm just uh, the, the um, you know, red-haired, red-headed stepchild that never gets asked, I guess. Oh, I'm so sorry. Never... Well, um, <laughs> we'd love to have you back anytime. And uh, okay, so we do have one more um, oh, yeah. question from David Owens. Um, is, is there any other strategies to remediate the adverse effects of dams other than what you've described, such as fish ladders and elevators and whatnot? Yeah, um, so the, the biggest challenge is that, that physical fish, fish passage. Uh, there's only so many ways that you can you know, bring a fish you know, from down below and up above a dam. So um, other than various derivations of kind of fish ladders, um, that's probably the most common when it comes to that. Um, as far mm. as other, other kind of issues like manipulating flows or temperature, that there is some efforts to um, try to um, simulate natural flows, at least within reason, um, you know, on some of these rivers. And same with um, the water temperature as well. And Flaming Gorge Dam in Utah has like what they call a a temperature control device. So it actually can alter the temperature being released uh, to mimic what should be there historically. Um, and, you know, I think it's, an, it's important to recognize with these things that, you know, particularly working, you know, in ecology and environmental science, I mean, we always look at dams inherently as bad. And, you know, the bottom line is with all of these issues, they're multiple use. I mean, we do need power, you know, we do need flood control. So it's, it's how to balance, you know, what we've done to some of these iconic species with the other human needs. Um, so it, it's, it's, I don't envy people that are in this um, situation to try to decide how to say, operate, you know, uh, Gavin's Point Dam. Uh, so there's a lot of multiple uses and um, depending on who you talk to, that there's way too much emphasis on fish or there's way too little emphasis on fish. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's it's a tough thing to deal with. Um, I will say too that there's been some emphasis on not only manipulations once dams are in place, but also uh, trying to help um, these companies site new dams. Like where would a dam be placed that would provide the least amount of impact uh, from an ecology standpoint? So uh, this is happening in other parts of, of the world as well. Well, um, a couple more things I just want to share that people have said. Um, Gracie Yonak or Jonak said, as a fellow Mizzou tiger, thank you for expanding my horizons. And I've learned so much about fish I probably wouldn't have otherwise. Um, Dean Har Hargit says, great talk, really appreciate it. Emily Canchola said, uh, that was very informative. Thank you very much. Um, and David Owens um, followed up his previous question just to say that, um, Oh, it just disappeared. Oh yeah, but I think it was, un I, I was reading, I think the, uh, is there unintended consequences <clears throat> with this? Yeah. And one that's a very obvious one right now is Asian carp or invasive species. So um, if we allow passage, do we allow, you know, how do we pick and choose what to pass? And mm -hmm. like that Menominee Dam, um, uh, that elevator, they inspect every fish that goes by. So, um, this is something that has come up in other rivers, uh, in the Kansas River, in fact, with a, a Bower Sock Dam, which is by Lawrence. But if you want to allow passage, there is a cost with that, or there's, in, there's a cost with allowing passage for everything, or someone has to monitor that 24-7 to not allow that passage. So that's one of the, the big unintended consequences. Um, the flip side is um, Lake Tanicomo has trout. Why does it have trout? Because through Table Rock Lake, they release cold water and now it creates a cold water fishery uh, for trout. So, um, so yeah, that's, it's not a universally good or universally bad thing. Right, right. Um, but it is important, however, to, ga to gather data so that we do know what's going on um, so that we can uh, try to tweak our management um, to, uh, to help some of these iconic species and, and even the not iconic species that the big ones feed on or whatever, you know? <laughs> um, well, uh, Craig, thank you so much. And uh, 
um, look forward to having you in the audience once again. And, and now you can sit down and think about um, what your next talk will be about. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get you back. We'll get you back here. Um, if anyone's still sitting on, um, I did just find out, uh, kind of, I reached out sort of a Hail Mary pass um, to my friend, Mike Leahy with um, the Missouri Department of Conservation. He's the natural areas coordinator. And he's done, he did a talk many years ago for us. And he's gonna come back next month and talk about some of the designated natural areas along the Missouri River in the state of Missouri, um, which is really kind of a cool um, to-do list of you know neat places to visit along the river in the state. So um, that'll be next month. Um, I've forgotten the date already. I think it's November 10th, but the second Tuesday in November, um, Mike Leahy with the Department of Conservation will be joining us. Um, so good night to everybody. And um, thank you, Craig. Um, yep. We'll see you next.